here. Okay. Yeah, so thanks uh, for the invitation to speak to you guys today. Um, I'm a, a urologist at Sloan Kettering, and my focus is really in kind of bladder and prostate cancer. And uh, uh, I specialize in minimally invasive surgery, namely um, uh, robotics. Uh, and one of the items that has been my focus is building the robotic cystectomy program with intracorporeal diversion. So that's going to be the focus of the talk today. You know, it's kind of meant to be um, open, interactive. This is a talk I give to our fellows each year. Um, some of you who've, who've been around for the, the, that time of year may have seen this. Um, but if you have questions or something's not clear, please just, you know, reach out, interrupt, uh, let me know, know uh, any questions that you have. So let me just go ahead and move forward. This is my disclosure. Uh, and here's the overview of the, the talk for today. So we'll talk about the evolution of minimally invasive cystectomy over the past 10 to 15 years. We'll talk about perioperative outcomes associated with this technique. We'll go through some of the evidence for uh, regarding oncologic control. And then I'm going to go through some of the advances we've made with regard to urinary diversion, namely intracorporeal diversion. We'll, we'll discuss some of the techniques uh, with this procedure. And then I'll talk about our, our current experience and then we'll finish. So as you guys all know, radical cystectomy is really the, the mainstay for high risk, non-muscle invasive and muscle invasive bladder cancer. It is three operations in one. You know, there, there's an extirpative portion of the procedure, which is the cystoprostatectomy and lymph node dissection. And then there's a reconstructive portion of the procedure uh, with the urinary diversion, which can be continent or incontinent. The goals of minimal invasive cystectomy, namely robotic surgery for invasive bladder cancer, really try to minimize the impact of the operation uh, on the patient. So the idea is to minimize the morbidity, try to enhance the recovery. Uh, we know this is a tough operation for patients to get over, but of course, at the core of this, we want to maintain oncologic and functional outcomes uh, as have been set by the gold standard, which is the open procedure. Anytime there's a new procedure, it's hard to call robotic cystectomy new anymore, but you know, relative to uh, open cystectomy, it is new. Uh, there are kind of four pillars uh, of the operation that need to be met. So first, of course, and foremost is cancer control. And the, the idea is to try to meet or improve upon the benchmarks with regard to cancer-specific outcomes. The other question that we'll look at today is, are there any differences in oncologic safety by the approach? The second, of course, is to maintain function uh, and uh, maintain functional outcomes as they relate to urinary reconstruction, whether that be a constant or incontinent diversion, and to maintain or improve quality of life in the perioperative long-term period. The idea is also to minimize complications. So the new procedure should try to reduce the morbidity of the operation and meet the same level of complications or improve on the complication rate as the standard. And then finally, the question that I think still remains is, is there a cost benefit? Does the added time or cost uh, regard, regarding the use of additional technology justify the approach? We'll look at some of those uh, during this talk. So when we talk about feasibility uh, about this operation, the question is, can this operation be done robotically? And can both part portions of the operation be done, meaning the extirpative and reconstruction? portion. Robotic cystectomy has been a while, uh, around for a while, as I mentioned. It was first done in 2003, where uh, Manny Menon and a group went to Egypt and did the first series of robotic cystectomies. In this uh, series, though, they did their reconstruction uh, extracorporeally, meaning they open to do the diversion. Some of the early concerns around robotic cystectomy regarded the length of surgery, and most centers adopted a robotic approach for the extirpation, but an extracorporeal approach or open approach for the diversion. And we'll see that in some of the early data that was published. The second question was, okay, you can remove the bladder, but what about the lymph nodes? Can you do an adequate lymph node dissection? Meaning, uh, are you able to do an extended or even super extended dissection? This is a template of what we typically would remove during uh, the radical cystectomy and lymph node dissection. And this includes the different echelons. 
So, you know, your standard dissection really includes the lymph nodes within the true pelvis. Those are your external iliac obturator, deep obturator, and they may or may not improve the, in, in, include the common iliac where the ureter crosses over the, the common iliac. And then your extended includes your iliacs, your common iliacs, as well as the presacral and usually uh, the supra aortic, the periaortic, pericabled up to the IMA. That would be what you would call an extended or even super extended dissection. So this has been looked at and there've been several series. All of these are uh, the level one uh, evidence or the randomized trials that have been done. I selected ones here for lymph node dissection. And really, as you can see these forest plots, there's no, really no difference uh, in lymph node yield. And that's been borne out in several studies uh, both uh, prospective as well as retrospective. But, but looking at just the level one evidence, there's no evident difference in the number of lymph nodes uh, that have been yielded, as well as the lymph node positivity rate. Those have been exactly the same uh, between open and robotic cystectomy. So I think at this point, there's really little uh, question that you can access the same areas robotically and uh, clear the same lymph node field. Uh, in an invasive fashion. The next question that came up uh, in the development of uh, minimally invasive robotic cystectomy was regarding complications. So this was a paper that came out of Memorial back in 2009, which kind of set the standard for what we'd expect complication rates to look like uh, after radical cystectomy. You can see two thirds of patients have some complication within 90 days. About 15% of those will be high grade complications and the mortality rate is usually between 1.5 to 3%. It can increase uh, uh, it with uh, higher ages, and we've shown that as well. But those are the uh, those are kind of the expected benchmarks for perioperative complications. This led to uh, the the first uh, large or intermediate size randomized trial looking at complications specifically. This was a randomized trial conducted at Memorial. The primary endpoint was to look at complications and to see if we could detect a 20% reduction in complications using a, a robotic approach for the cystectomy. What we found here was that robotic cystectomy was associated with less blood loss. It had a longer operative time, but when we looked at complications, both low and high grade or overall, there were no significant differences in the overall rates. Uh, however, the types of complications, when, when you look a little deeper, were different. So although the numeric number was the same, when you look at things that relate to uh, a lesser, less invasive operation like wounds, there was a significantly lower risk of wound complications, whether that be uh, dehiscences, infections, or hernias. And you can see it was about one fifth of what you would see uh, in the open group. That's that last line there. In this study also uh, quality of life outcomes were evaluated and uh, these were taken at baseline three and six months and there showed no difference. And what we can take away from this is that most of the recovery, and I'll show you a little bit later, most of that recovery does happen in that first three months. So a lot of the differences may not have been picked up. Now the limitations to this data of course uh, were that the cystectomy was done robotically but the diversion was done open. And so the thought may be that by having an intracorporeal diversion this may affect the complications and we'll, we'll go through some of that data a little bit later. This uh, is more recent data that has come out of the Netherlands. It was just published. It was, it's called the RACE trial. It's a comparative effectiveness trial uh, it was multi-center, 19 centers in ne the Netherlands. Again, they looked at complications as their primary endpoint. The difference here is it was a non-randomized but prospective comparison between open radical cystectomy and robotic in about 350 patients. And what they did find with that was that there were no significant differences between any complications and major complications between the two groups. Although if you look at the trend for any complication, it was lower in the robotic group. And that uh, may explain some of the confidence intervals that they noted. But it, when you look at high grade complications, so that's three or higher, it was pretty much the same, 15% versus 16% uh, 
Uh, and that's exactly what we saw in the original Shabsik paper. Now, when we look at the, the other findings, the secondary outcomes, uh, as, as you can imagine, there was more blood loss with open cystectomy. There were, it was a shorter time period for the operation, but there was more, more use of ICU, patients going to the ICU after the operation, an increase in the use of TPN, longer length of stays, a decrease in the overall node count, and a higher soft tissue positive surgical margin rate in their open uh, cystectomy. This happened in a contemporary period uh, between 2016 to 2018. So it was not comparing robotic cystectomy done today versus old open radical cystectomy. These were done at the same time contemporaneously. They looked at some health quality, uh, health related quality of life outcomes. Namely, they looked at the BCI and um, the FACT uh, um, survey related to cystectomy. And they looked at one month, three months, six months, and 12. They did note that most dipped in that first uh, three months, but they did not see any statistical differences uh, in those health related outcomes. So let's turn over into the oncologic considerations. So we've established so far that there's no, does not appear to be any increase uh, or significant difference in perioperative complications between open and robotic as categorized by the Clavian Dindo scale. Let's talk about the oncologic considerations. So some this is Don Skinner, you know, one of the early fathers of radical cystectomy. Uh, and as you, you know, the radical cystectomy is really a standard of care for invasive disease. It provides excellent local control for invasive bladder cancer, and it involves resection of all paravesical tissues, including the pelvic lymph node dissection, uh, and especially here the idea is an, is an extended or thorough pelvic lymph node dissection. The idea is the oncologic principles here that we perform in an open setting are the same things that we would promote in a robotic setting. And then these include wide resection of all peri and paravesical tissue. We avoid spillage or perforation and take care of specimen handling. When we're doing this robotically, trying to maintain a closed system in that we close off the urethra, we place this in a bag. All specimens are placed in a bag immediately. Lymph nodes are always removed in a bag, not piecemeal. And then we irrigate thoroughly and evacuate all fluid. We know the impact of positive surgical margin, <clears throat> and this is a comparison of the recurrence rates. So one of the, the main drivers for local failure or local recurrence is uh, extra vesicle disease as well as positive surgical margin. Having a positive surgical margin does increase that risk by almost 70%. That's what you can see here in the figures. So this is a video here. Hopefully this video will play, but this is just an illustration of what we do during the cystectomy. So this is on the left side, coming down, we're clipping the medial umbilical ligament here and starting to take the pedicles. <clears throat> I'm using a, a vessel sealer here. So here you can see all the paravesical and perivesical tissue all the way from the pelvic floor that we're sweeping up onto our specimen. You hear that when when we do cystectomies together. Down in that lower panel, you can see the same operation being done open. You see the angle at which we're taking the vessel sealer. It's actually one of my colleagues, Dr. Bachner, doing it open. And this is exactly what we mimic when we do it robotically. So we're taking all that tissue, going widely uh, around the uh, base of the bladder. This is a, this posterior lateral base is a common site for positive surgical margin. So it's an area to take special care when doing that resection. So you're coming right down to the pararectal space for that, and that's to avoid that margin. We looked at our, uh, our patients from the complication randomized trial, and we looked at the oncologic outcomes. You can see these two panels here are looking at the probability of recurrence or, or, uh, or cancer-specific death. And there was no statistical difference between the two, carrying these out uh, all the way uh, to six years uh, in follow-up. However, uh, when we look at the patterns of recurrence, uh, we found that distant recurrences were more frequently seen in the open radical cystectomy group. 
And although no differences in the local recurrence, when you combine local and abdominal recurrences, there, there appeared to be a statistical difference as in the, there was a higher rate in the robotic group. Um, the, keep in mind, this study was not powered to detect uh, these kind of differences, but it was something that we reported in. Uh, we'll get into this in terms of we talk about, you know, are there any differences in the pattern of spread? I mean, the short answer is uh, I don't think there is, but I'll show you some evidence uh, to help try to help support that. This is the RAZOR trial. You're, you may be familiar with this. This was the formal randomized multicenter trial looking at uh, the oncologic outcome specifically as the endpoint uh, comparing robotic versus open cystectomy. And their primary endpoint was a non-inferiority of 15% or less in terms of progression-free survival at two years. So this was powered to that endpoint specifically, and it was geared to answer the question, was there any difference? And this is the highest level of evidence that we have uh, so far in this space. This was 15 participating institutions and uh, about 300 patients uh, involved in the study. Here are the demographics of the, of the patients involved in the study. As you can see, there could be some patient selection here as in about 85% of the patients had uh, organ confined disease or, or less uh, in the study. If we compare the open and robotic, there was a slightly higher neoadjuvant rate in the open group, <clears throat> but otherwise the, the distributions were pretty similar. You can see also the majority of patients received an ileal conduit. This is the primary outcome from the study. This is the pro protocol, per protocol and intention to treat. And you can see the progression-free survival was exactly the same, no matter how you sliced it. No differences at two years. And I think I have a slide, uh, it'll be in a little bit about the three year outcome, which are now available. The other secondary findings uh, are consistent with some of the other studies published to date, decreased blood loss associated with robotic cystectomy, decreased transfusion rate. This was the first study to show a decrease in the length of stay by one day. Lymph node yields, lymph node percent positivity were exactly the same. And there were no differences in positive surgical margins. Namely, we look at the soft tissue surgical margins 6% to 5%, that's similar to what we showed in, in our randomized study, about 4%. When we look at complications, there was no difference in overall complications either. But again, one of the themes that emerges is when we look at the specific type of complications, there were some differences related to the wound. Even though the diversions were done extracorporeally, the wound complications were quite different. Uh, twice as high for superficial wound infections and three times for deep wound infections. And for wound to hit systems, there were none in the robotic group versus two or three in the open group. So even though they made an incision to do the diversion, it was smaller and still there was some benefit uh, from a uh, wound standpoint. Other takeaways from this study. So how, how do we put this in the context of, of the rest of the data? So it was the first multi-center randomized trial to be conducted looking at oncologic outcomes specifically. There is potential for selection bias, as I mentioned, because um, although these were all high volume centers, only eight patients per center per year were enrolled. And you can imagine these centers were doing more cystectomies than that during the same time period. As I mentioned, only 14% of patients were more than T2 or non-organ confined. And, our experiences would suggest that that number as a general population would be higher. There was heterogeneous surgical experience. The minimum number I think was 30 cases a surgeon had to perform to qualify for the study. Uh, but the findings that were consistent were decreased blood loss, uh, no changes in overall complications and a slightly longer operative time for robotic cystectomy. As I mentioned before, all diversions were extracorporeal. So this gets to the question related to uh, cancer control and does the approach actually matter? This was a follow-up study out of your institution. I think some of you on the call here are, are authors here. Uh, and this was uh, to address a follow-up question that was raised uh, from your group about were there differences in atypical recurrences and or carcinomatosis related to a, robo a robotic approach? So this looked at the cohort of 300 patients uh, and it looked at uh, specifically 
what were the drivers for recurrence, uh, in particular peritoneal recurrence. Positive surgical margin rate in this series was similar to others, 6.8%, and isolated peritoneal carcinomatosis for overall was less than 3%. I'll show you some more data of what that rate looks like uh, in other centers, um, but that seems acceptable. The other point about this was when, when different factors to predict recurrence were looked at, it seemed that tumor biology was the main driver, meaning uh, factors like stage, lymphovascular invasion. There were other, some per other perioperative like uh, renal insufficiency and perioperative transfusion rates that were also associated with recurrence. Operative time and the presence of positive surgical margins were not associated with its atypical recurrences. And so the conclusion was that the approach was probably perhaps not the driver of recurrence, but more the biology or the nature of the tumor. Now this was limited in that it was retrospective and a single surgeon experience as well as non-comparative. Following on this, there were several groups who looked at this question of atypical recurrences. This came out of the European Robotic Urologic Section, uh, uh, several centers, nine centers doing robotic cystectomy with intracorporeal diversion. They tried to look at early recurrences within the first one to two years, uh, or even before that, three months. <clears throat> and they had around 700 patients. All these patients underwent robotic cystectomy with intracorporeal diversion. Their soft tissue margin rate was acceptable. It's compar comparable to most large series, 4.8%. Uh, most of those patients who had a positive surgical margin were more than uh, were extra uh, vesicle in nature. And their peritoneal carcinomatosis rate was very low, 0.7%, only five of the patients out of the series. Their predictors, when they looked at multiple factors to predict recurrence, uh, was lymph node positivity, non-organ confined disease, or stage age, as we've seen before, positive surgical margin did not pan out as a predictor uh, for recurrence in the, in the multivariate. Uh, and then again, this was a retrospective study uh, with differences in surgeon experience and potential for selection bias. As I uh, mentioned before, that we now have three-year data from Razor. This has been published uh, in the Journal of Urology last year. It looked at the recurrence rates at three years, and again, they were identical no difference in recurrence, free survival, uh, or, or overall survival, as you can see the, the headline there. When they looked at recurrences, local recurrences happened at three and 4%, which were exactly the same as well, and distant recurrences were the same. They did not see any port site metastases in, in this series of 300 patients. Predictors for uh, worse uh, survival and recurrence were age, poor performance status, and the association of complications, major ones. Uh, stage and positive surgical margin did, did, did uh, associate with higher recurrence, uh, lower progression free survival and overall survival. And the surgical approach, whether it was robotic or open, did not associate with any of these factors or any of the outcomes of recurrence. Next, we have uh, a 10-year report from the Mayo Clinic. This was their uh, retrospective look at their prospective database of uh, robotic cystectomy and open compared to open cystectomy. Again, looking at recurrence rates, uh, and there were no differences in recurrence rates. Their local recurrence rate, again, 6% uh, to 7%, no differences there. Atypical recurrence is exactly the same. This was defined as port site, abdominal wall, or peritoneal carcinomatosis no differences. Again, the predictors were biology, stage, lymph node positivity, positive surgical margin, and lymphovascular invasion. They looked at approach to see if it was a predictor and it was not. Again, adding support that the approach of the surgery does not appear to affect the oncologic outcomes. I think, and then this is the final, I think, piece of data I have most recently released. This is from the IRCC, International Robotic Cystectomy Consortium. Over 2,000 patients from 28 institutions, they looked at the, their local recurrence rate, 11%, 5% in the pelvis, uh, their distant recurrence rate, 20%, 6% in the lungs is the most common. <clears throat> the site, or, or sorry, the rate for abdominal wall port site recurrence is 1%, same with peritoneal carcinomatosis. So this is in line with what we've seen in various other series and, and supportive. Uh, of the fact that the approach doesn't appear to affect the recurrence rate or the recurrence patterns uh, for that matter. Again, drivers, higher stage, 
the presence of preoperative hydronephrosis, which is a, an association with higher stage lymph node positivity and positive surgical margins. So those seem to be the main drivers for outcomes. This is, of course, the limitations here of the RCC. It's a voluntary submitted data set. It's retrospective. Uh, and there's definitely a lot of heterogeneity in the experience there. But even with that heterogeneity, we, we saw no differences, uh, or they reported no differences. And that this table here just reflects that, uh, looking at the different outcomes for, uh, for recurrence and overall survival. So I'll just summarize some of the level one evidence that we have so far uh, with regard to robotic cystectomy. Uh, and there have been five published randomized trials. The themes that are consistent throughout are that robotic cystectomy is associated with less blood loss, longer operative time. It has been shown in one of the studies to have lower, uh, shorter length of stay and no differences in overall uh, and major outcome uh, complications. Pathologic outcomes seem the same. And as you know, we just showed, there's no differences in recurrence rates or the types of recurrences. To date, what's been published is all of these diversions have been extracorporeal. So uh, we await the outcomes of the IROC trial, which I'll show you a little bit next, which incorporates intracorporeal diversion. So that's this is the IROC trial. I believe it's uh, finished accruing at this point. 300 patients, it's uh, conducted out of this multi-center, multiple centers out of the UK. Their primary endpoint is days out of hospital within the first 90 days, but they have a lot of secondary endpoints with regard to recovery of physical function, functional recovery. Uh, they're using trackers uh, to, to look at steps and to try to really understand what is the difference or impact in that first 90 days after the operation. And I think that's probably the sweet spot of where we'll see uh, the benefit from uh, a minimally invasive approach. This is just pulled out of a, an abstract from the EUA a couple years ago, where they just they showed some of their preliminary data. They fully accrued, uh, and this is some of their recovery, just looking at the fitness. And again, if we look at that, these are the number of steps that are happening at baseline, post-op, one in three months. By three months, most folks are getting back to their number of steps. And same thing uh, as you kind of look at the line graph over here by that three months, people are back to baseline, which is what we've seen in, in most of the recovery data. I'll share with you some of the recovery data that we have uh, at, at MSK as well. So I'll pause there for a moment. Any questions so far uh, about uh, what we talked about? I'm gonna transition into the intracorporeal diversion part. Any, any questions there on the line? Um, any changes in like the cost level of reimburs uh, reimbursements over time and things that you see that would still benefit that portion until we get the good data from intracorporeal, uh, intracorporeal changes? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, just like most robotic cases, there's usually a little bit of a premium in, in terms of the charges, like, for example, open prostatectomy versus robotic prostatectomy. So when you bill for robotic cystectomy, there's a little premium. I don't know that it pays necessarily anymore. Um, they try to build a little bit more. Uh, there's not a robotic cystectomy code currently, so and there probably never will be, just because uh, the volume of these cases has never been enough to warrant a change to the CPT codes, and I don't think it's high on the AUA's advocacy list. But the, but as far as I understand uh, from from the hospital, they don't have any trouble getting reimbursed. It might require a little bit of documentation, uh, so that from that standpoint. In terms of cost, cost is a hard thing to tackle because there are so many uh, settings in which you have to kind of consider the cost. So, you know, there's intraoperative setting, there's the hospital, immediate hospital setting, and of course there's the wider well. What's the impact? What's the return to work? What's the ability to go on to chemotherapy? So there hasn't been any really good study to try to tackle that and to comprehensively look at it. Thank you. All right, so let's continue on with uh, the, uh, we'll talk now about the utilization of cystectomy and then we'll talk about intracorporeal diversion. So as you can see here, this is a little bit older graph, but this is looking at robotic cystectomy experience that's in the red. You can see it's increased quite a bit since 08 um, and probably around now it's sitting at maybe 40% uh, of the cases in the United States are being done robotically and it's it's continuing to, to grow in its prevalence. You can see that 
also in the decline and open radical cystectomy. That is also uh, seen in Europe, uh, a rise in the robotic cystectomy and intracorporeal diversion use. Okay. This is a smaller study uh, looking again at the same question about the increased prevalence at 12 centers in North America and, United, and Europe. Uh, looking, the orange curve is the increase in robotic cystectomy use uh, over the past uh, decade, essentially. And you can see by 2012 to current is really when robotic cystectomy has really become into prominence, uh, at least in this, uh, this group of about 2,400 patients. Um, you know, the majority of these patients were getting robotic cystectomy by the end <clears throat> of the study period. So let's talk about intracorporeal diversion because that's really the final step in, in kind of the development of this operation uh, and performing it completely minimally invasively. So many centers still, although they may perform robotic cystectomy, perform an extracorporeal diversion. Some of the reasons related to this have to do with the technical challenges associated with the operation. It does add a, a bit more time, although on average, it's about an hour more than an open cystectomy. The learning curve is steep, so it can be challenging to master. And at least in the beginning, some series have showed an increase in complications uh, that can be overcome with mentorship and, and uh, directed learning with a more experienced surgeon. That being said, intracorporeal diversion utilization is increasing. If we look at, again, the IRCC, they showed that an increase from 18% to 51% uh, of the of the patients in that entire database. And in the more recent years, the ones reporting to this database, the vast majority of them are doing these robotically and with intracorporeal diversion. And just take in mind that that is a select group who will report to this database. These are the trends of diversion and diversion types taken from that IRCC data. The red here of, on, on top is the extracorporeal incontinent diversion rate. And you can see the, the robotic, that's kind of brownish color, it's rising while the other is falling. And you can see by the end of uh, 14, 15, about 80% of their diversions were being done uh, in, intracorporeally for the incontinent group. If we look at the continent, there is the green line here, and that's the intracorporeal. So you can see there's a slight rise, but still a fairly low number about maybe 20% of their overall surgeries or, or less are happening uh, as neobladders or continent diversions. And there was a decline in their extracorporeal continent diversions, mostly probably converting over to uh, the um, intracorporeal approach. So still some work to be done there. With regard to uh, intracorporeal diversion, all of these operations have been done, conduits, neobladders, continent cutaneous, we and others have published on all of these approaches and replicating the same principles of how you would do this procedure in an open fashion. We're gonna walk through some of these diversions and the technique here. Um, but the bottom line is that we're able to offer this uh, to all patients. You know, Having a robotic surgery doesn't preclude the ability to have a continent diversion. And in our center, we offer uh, continent diversions at the same frequency, whether you have it robotic uh, or open. Uh, and we've, we've, we've demonstrated how that can be done safely here. So the question next becomes, well, can we reduce the morbidity of this, this operation robotically? This was data from the National Cancer Database uh, looking at uh, uh, almost 10,000 patients who've had robotic and open surgery. Uh, as we've seen uh, in some of the other data, robotic, surgery, uh, robotic cystectomy was associated with a lower length of stay decreased prolonged length of stay, meaning more than seven days. Admission rates were similar. And in this retrospective review, there seemed to be a decrease in post-operative mortality at the 30 and 90 day uh, landmark. So there's some, day, some suggestion that perhaps the robotic approach could be better tolerated and perhaps uh, in our older patients even so. What are the potential benefits of an intracorporeal diversion? Well, these are, these are what have been proposed. It's a closed system, so we don't open. So there's decrease in sensible losses. There's a smaller wound. We already saw with even extracorporeal diversion, there was decreased wound morbidity. And this can almost be eliminated by an intracorporeal approach. There's decrease, decrease in pain medication requirements 
and the potential for return, quicker return of bowel function. Although many of the ERAS pathways we have now help really help have helped to uh, optimize the bowel return uh, after surgery. Question about did intracorporeal diversion itself help reduce complications? The answer is a little bit mixed. Uh, this is data both from two studies, papers published out of the IRCC. The first study, smaller, much fewer intracorporeal diversions, only 167 out of their larger group. The, and it showed a lower number of GI complications and infections. This was probably driven mostly by experience. As you can see in that intracorporeal group, there was a high number of patients who were getting neobladders, and most of the surgeons taking on intracorporeal diversion back in 14 were the most experienced robotic surgeons. So that was probably a matter of uh, surgeon uh, experience. When the, they followed up the study in 2018, many more intracorporeal diversions, a much fewer rate of, uh, of continent diversions, they saw that, in fact, there was a higher rate of complications overall uh, and high grade with the intracorial group, only on univariate analysis. This did not hold up on the multivariate analysis. Uh, the only thing that did was prior abdominal surgery that factored into high grade complications. But the thought in this case was as, as, most, as many surgeons in this group were picking up or learning intracorporeal diversion, they saw a higher complication rate. So this was probably more reflective of surgeon inexperience. Uh, so the opposite as this was gained. So it didn't really help answer too, many, too much of the question of the impact of intracorporeal diversion. And this still remains an open question. The, probably the best study to date that helps to look at this was a study out of Cleveland Clinic, 948 patients. They looked at their entire cohort of uh, radical cystectomies, open, intracorporeal, and extracorporeal. They had about a third in each. Of note, about 77% of these patients had ileal conduits, and they looked over a seven-year period, uh, seven period with 10 surgeons. The majority of them performing one form of the procedure, but some performing, uh, performing both. And this is the data that they showed. So each column here represents a different approach, intracorporeal, extracorporeal, and open cystectomy. And they showed a significant difference uh, in decreased blood loss, decreased ileus rate, decreased length of stay, and a significant difference in a decrease in 30-day high-grade and 90-day high-grade complications. This is one of the first papers to actually show that difference in a, in a large group of patients. Uh, and you can see this is, was fairly balanced in the numbers. One thing to add in particular about this data, though, is that <clears throat> as the series went on over the seven years, more surgeons were converting to doing intracorporeal robotic cystectomy with intracorporeal diversion. So there could be a time uh, difference uh, in, in your comparing kind of newer, fresher patients versus an older set of patients where patient care pathways and clinical pathways may have changed. So that could be a confounder. Predictors of 90-day uh, complications were age, comorbidities, and operative time. And in this series, uh, intracorporeal diversion was independently associated with the reduction in 90-day major complications. It's one of the first series to actually show that. The other thing about uh, a robotic approach is can we affect stricture rates? So this was a, one of the papers that came out a while back out of Vanderbilt looking at stricture rates. And uh, what it showed was that there was a higher, there was a numerically higher rate of strictures in robotic cystectomy with extracorporeal diversion, although this is not statistically significant. This was quite a shock because this was much higher than most of the large open series that had been reported. And some of the conclusions were that Overall, this rate was too high, whether it was robotic or open. Uh, we published a paper looking at this from the SEER database. We looked at stricture rates um, comparing uh, open versus robotic. And the definition for stricture here was any intervention with hydronephosis uh, requiring like a PCN, a stent, uh, or surgery. And we found a statistically higher uh, rate of stricture rate after robotic cystectomy. The question here was during the, the period of this is to up to 2014, and most of these patients had extracorporeal diversion. Other predictors we saw were preoperative hydro was a strict uh, predictor for stricture rate, 
as well, uh, a reduction in stroke rate was with higher hospital volume, which, which makes sense. They're more experience, less chance for that. So how can we optimize uh, stricture or reduce the formation of stricture rate intracorporeally? Well, there are a few reasons to think that this might be possible. One, uh, uh, these are just principles of managing the urine, of course, maintaining as much uh, periureteral vasculature and blood supply, minimize over dissection. This can be done because you need less length on the ureter to meet your diversion when you do it intracorporeally. You're, you're connecting it directly where the diversion will sit. You don't have to deliver the ureters out of the body uh, and risk connecting a well uh, underperfused segment. You can discard any redundant segments or any excessive ureter and trim it exactly to the site where you'll do the anastomosis. And of course, you want to minimize the handling. There's some other issues or, or, or tools and techniques, which I'll go through, and that one of these is the use of ICG. So this is intraoperative fluorescence. Uh, now, so let me show you this video. Let's see if this will play. So here we are, we finished the neobladder. We're gonna connect the ureters in and these ureters look pretty pink. We've given some ICG. You can see this is where the left ureter is gonna connect and you've got nice, well perfused, it's a green looking ureter. <clears throat> you can see that greenness coming through. Now, when we look at the right ureter under ICG, you see it's pretty pale. I don't know if you can pick that up pretty well, but this is where we'd normally do our transection. And here it looks fine by, by vision, but under fluorescence, there is no fluorescence. It's not until we get more proximal, we start to see some of this fluorescence come through and that's related to perfusion. So instead we revise the anastomosis here, we uh, transect it and spatulate it and that's where we perform the anastomosis. And there've been two studies published to date looking at this, I mean, they've been uh, uh, retrospective in nature and small, but it appears to show that uh, that using ICG can help reduce that stricture rate. And these are the two studies I just mentioned. One's in an open setting, one's in a robotic. Uh, the the one here in, in uh, BJU was a little bit over the top. I mean, they found no strictures in the ICG group versus the non-ICG group. I think that's probably just related to not enough time. But still, the, the, a 10% reduction is, is quite impressive. This next one was out of City of Hope. It looked at uh, open uh, diversion, open radical cystectomy. And they sort of show, showed a significant reduction in structure rate using ICG to help measure perfusion. So let's talk in about uh, intracorporeal diversion. I know we're getting a little late in the hour. Do you guys still have some time or uh, to keep going? Yeah, yeah, let's keep going. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. We got started a little late, but so let's go through this. This is probably the meat and potatoes of what you want to hear anyway. So this is uh, how we do our intracorporeal diversion. Are the videos coming across okay? Are you able to see them? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're coming across fine. Great. So here are the diversion steps are common to every urinary diversion. The good news is that when you start to learn this, you learn the simple diversions first. They These techniques or skills are things that you can build to perform the more complex ones. So these are bowel segmentation, managing the bowel, performing a bowel anastomosis, whether it's ilio ilio or ilio colonic. Then there's a reconstruction portion, sewing the bowel usually, and then an anastomosis, ureteral or urethral. These are the segmentations we take for a neobladder on the left panel and then a, a continent cutaneous on the right. So we're talking about 44 centimeters on the on the right hand side for a neobladder with a little afferent limb, 30 centimeters of the ascending colon for a continent cutaneous and a little bit of the terminal ilium for the, for the efferent channel. And these are just demonstrations of the, this is ileocolonic anastomosis, which I'll show you how we do. And that's the pictorial of what the neobladder looks like. So first steps, let's talk about the ileoconduit. So first steps, we're gonna talk about bowel handling. So we're using these double fenestrated or tip-up graspers to handle the bowel. They're nice because they distribute the, the, the force like a bowel grasper, a laparoscopic bowel grasper, measuring about 15 centimeters from the illocecal valve, and then performing a transection with a bowel load stapler. Then to measure the conduit, we measure from the abdominal wall down to the sacrum. And then we perform our proximal division. And this is a bowel load stapler. It's generally the blue or purple loads. 
Uh, and then this is the butt end of the conduit, which ex excluding the staple line here by under sewing it, or we'll some, you know we'll resect it and over sew it uh, to exclude that. So that that's a uh, bowel segmentation. The next part is the bowel anastomosis. So this is probably what gets folks most nervous about when they're starting out doing intracorporeal diversion. So here we are trimming off the anti-mesenteric sides of the bowel. We're performing a side-to-side -side bowel anastomosis, stapling from the left side of the patient's abdomen, 60 millimeter stapler down the, the anti-mesenteric side. Uh, usually we'll do two fires down the anti-mesenteric side and then one fire transversely in, in order to complete the anastomosis. Very standard, exactly what you do in an open setting, side-to-side -side bowel anastomosis. The next uh, is to perform the ureteral anastomosis. So I usually favor doing a rosebud uh, bricker for the ileal conduit. We trim off the distal end, and then we start to do the anastomosis. This is the left ureter. We transect it. Now we're using ICG to verify perfusion. Then we'll make a small ileotomy and then perform a running anastomosis. This is 4-0 vicral. Uh, we'll start the back end backside of the anastomosis first, and it's running, taking a bite uh, of the ileal conduit and then of the ureter. Stent, we're gonna pay, place, this is a single J stent, placed percutaneously through a mini port, and then we will tunnel it out the stoma end of the conduit. So now this is just delivery of that stent out. Once the stent is delivered, then we'll finish the other half of the anastomosis, done in a running fashion, uh, same 4-0 vicral. And then the, the right side of the uh, right ureter anastomosis done identical fashion, spatulated generously, and then perform half the anastomosis, place the stent, and then complete the other half. The stents usually stay in for about a week. We'll take them out uh, either in the hospital or uh, the following week in clinic. So then after that is done, we'll deliver uh, the stoma out through the stoma site, which is pre-marked, and then we'll mature it. The next step, we'll just go through the neobladder technique here pretty quickly. Uh, this, is, uh, this is using basically the same dimension as a, a Studer ileal neobladder. This is similar to what we performed at USC uh, in an open fashion. We maintain the same bowel dimensions, 44 centimeters for the pouch, 12 to 15 for the afferent limb. It's a sewn reconstruction, meaning that uh, we, we don't use any staples and we remove all staples from the reconstruction. It's cross-folded to maintain a globular pouch formation. The anastomosis to the urethra and the ureteral anastomoses are all running. These are the dimensions of the bowel as I showed you before. This is a little pictorial on the right-hand side showing the bowel dimensions as you would see them uh, intracorporeally. So looking toward the pelvis at the top of the screen uh, these are your two 20, 22 centimeter limbs to make 44, and then your afferent limb. Of interest here, this is the, what I call the 11 centimeter mark. That's where we perform the anastomosis of the urethra to the neobladder. And that's, uh, this is one fold, and then we'll fold uh, again this way to cross fold it. I'll show you this here in the video. So here is identifying the ileal sequel valve. We're going to march back and then find the most dependent limb of bowel that goes down to the urethra. So I mark this with a suture. I'm gonna measure 11 centimeters forward. This is an 11 centimeter stitch I'm using as a ruler. We measure 11 centimeters forward and this will be our distal division. Same stapling technique, 60 millimeter bowel load stapler. So now we have an 11 centimeter limb, I measure it. And now I have 22 centimeters. That's where I'm marking my 22 centimeter mark. We'll measure the 33 centimeter mark here, and then we mark again. And then we'll measure to the end, that's our 44 centimeters. Now we'll measure the afferent limb, it's 15 centimeters. And this, this is a discard segment about proximally. Okay, so that is how we've now isolated the bowel. Now we're gonna do the reconstruction. So we open the bowel along the anti-mesenteric side, biased a little bit toward the mesentery, so this is opened, and then we'll sew the posterior plate. So now this is 22 centimeters in each side. We're retracting the bowel toward the pelvis. <clears throat> and this is a barbed suture we use 
to do the approximation of the posterior plate. We will use several of the zero vicral sutures to line up the posterior wall, and then we'll sew this together. Uh, this is a running suture to get the posterior plate together. So now we have a plate here, 22 centimeters in length, uh, folded on itself. The next step here, which is different from what you might do in an open setting, is to perform the urethral anastomosis. So we're going to take the pouch, it's already done with the posterior plate, we're going to rotate it 90 degrees counterclockwise, and then perform the urethral ileal anastomosis. Why do we do this? Well, the reason to do this is to set up the second line of tension for cross folding. So in this case, we've done a cystectomy, we've done nerves, nerve sparing, see the nerves, neurovascular bundles on each side, and we're going to bring down the neobladder to perform the urethral ileal anastomosis. So we haven't closed the bladder completely. We've rotated the pouch and now we're gonna attach this 11 centimeter mark, which we found at the very beginning down to the urethra. We'll set up the, this is like a, a modified uh, stay stitch to hold the pouch in place. It takes a little bit of pressure off the anastomosis. And now we'll do the anastomosis. So this is a three zero monocryl monofilament suture. Uh, it's double armed about seven inches on each side, and we will run this to perform the anastomosis. We're delivering now the rouge catheter, and over this rouge catheter, we'll finish the anastomosis uh, and then tie it. So what this does now is it pins the neobladder in place, and it starts the next fold. So as you can see, with the neobladder secured here at the urethra, you've developed a new line of tension here, which makes it natural naturally to fold 22 centimeters up, up to that zero mark. So now we'll do the anterior closure. Uh, and that's, again, we're using barb suture to close that uh, anterior line. And that'll complete the closure of the pouch. The next steps are the ureteral anastomosis. Just as I've shown you before, we spatulate, doing a running anastomosis, minimal handling or no touching or crushing of the ure ureter. We verify the perfusion before we anastomose it, and then we use a stent here. That'll come out around three weeks afterwards. Here is the final result. This patient of mine who had a robotic cystectomy neobladder. There's his urogram around three months postoperatively. You can see the bladder there and no hydronephrosis. All right, any questions you guys have at that, about that, about the neobladder? I know it can be a little confusing in, in terms of the sequence there. We're all ready to operate. Let's do it. Uh, yeah, good. Gorgeous looking. <laughs> so the next is the conic cutaneous Indiana pouch. So we published on this back in 2015, how to do the Indiana pouch robotically. Um, this is the setup. This is uh, the XI setup. So actually we can use a six uh, arm setup just as we've done before. We shift some of the ports up like this right hand port shifted up. This, this right hand lateral port is a 15 millimeter port, which allows the stapler to come through. And I'll explain to you why we staple from that side as opposed to the left side. And then this is the stoma site. This is the bowel selection again, 30 centimeters, the ascending colon. You're going to mobilize the colon all the way up to the hepatic flexure. We start this case in the typical supine position with the robot coming from below uh, or from a side looking to look below toward the pelvis. And then as we move toward the Indiana pouch, we airplane the bed with the right side up and rotate the boom to allow access to the colon. The reason why it's uh, helpful to have that 15 port laterally is when you do an ileal colonic anastomosis, your actual direction of stapling is from the right to left. So it's handy to have that stapler pointing in that direction because so, you're seeing here you're going to anastomose the condo, the uh, ilium, terminal ilium, to the transverse colon. And here's just an example of that. Stapler coming in from the patient's right. We've got the terminal ilium uh, being placed onto the stapler. And then the, oh, sorry, that was a transverse colon on the stapler. And then the terminal ilium here coming on. And it's the same side to side anastomosis, anti mesenteric side. This is a 60 millimeter, this is a 45 millimeter staple that had not had the 60 when this video was done. We used two fires of that and then another transversely to complete it. So that just tees off the anastomosis. 
very similar to what we do with the ILIO ILIO. This is uh, our series that we published a few years ago. Uh, doing these diversions intracorporally, we've made some modifications to the head technique a little bit. 11 patients for a variety of reasons, uh, about half of them female. Um, and in terms of their uh, outcomes and things like that have been very good. Um, in terms of modifications, what we've done, we typically in the past have connected the ureters directly to the pouch. Um, but one of the things that has made this smoother and easier actually is to use a small limb of ilium as an afferent limb like we do for the for studers. And uh, it makes the anastomosis quite straightforward. Uh, we connect that into the Indiana and then you have a efferent limb, which is a stoma channel that's tapered and brought up to the skin. This is a, a contemporary MSK experience, although we have, up, we have this is from a couple years ago. Uh, we haven't updated the numbers recently, um, but you can see the number of continent diversions that we have is 45%. Uh, and that's similar to our, our previous reported extracorporeal diversion uh, and also our open experience to about half of our patients get continent diversions. Uh, significantly different from what you've seen in the Cleveland Clinic experience, other centers, as well as the Razor, where only about 15 to 20% of patients were getting continent diversions. The use of neoadjuvant chemotherapy is about 55 to 60 percent. Operative times usually about an hour uh, to, uh, to an hour and a half longer, especially for neobladders. Uh, EBL rates are there; you can see quite low. Transfusion rates low. Um, ileus rates still about 20 percent, which is in line with what they saw with the Cleveland Clinic experience. And then our length of stays have decreased uh, significantly from our previous reported robotic cystectomy with extra diversion, we're down to about four, four days median length of stay. Complication rates uh, remain similar, about 18% uh, for high grade, 10% for uh, high grade within 30 days. Other thing we're looking at, of course, is functional recovery. Uh, actually, Rand uh, has been giving a hand with this, uh, and Ashwin are getting involved. Functional recovery, we're looking at what's happening with our robotic cystectomy and intracorporeal diversion patients. This is a look at the uh, short form mental and functional recovery. You can see most recovery happens in that first 12 weeks uh, after the operation. They're back to baseline around 12 weeks. That's about three months is what we saw in the other studies I showed to you. And then in terms of recovery of ADLs, IEDLs, activities of daily living, these happen pretty quickly. Again, happening in, in the usually the first uh, two to three months afterwards. So really pointing to the fact that that most of the recovery and the benefit of a minimally invasive approach is gonna be in that window. And that's, if we want to identify, that's where we should look. So uh, in summary, this has been kind of the maturation of robotic cystectomy over the years. We looked at the extirpative portion, which has been shown to be equivalent. Uh, oncologic outcomes appear to be very similar. Uh, we know it's safe and it could be done safely. Intracorporeal has been the last uh, phase of uh, maturation for this operation, but you can see in the recent publications, this can be done reliably. I think we have some work in trying to extend the number of continent diversions that are being done around the country. This uh, unfortunately has been the case, whether it's open or robotic, most centers of excellence do more continent diversions than uh, other centers outside. Mentorship can be helpful. It helps overcome this learning curve and it's been shown to help reduce complications in that early learning curve. So the final thoughts, we know that there's level and evidence showing oncologic uh, similarity between uh, open and robotic cystectomy. Overall complications are, are exactly the same. These are the themes that we saw before, lower blood loss, lower transfusion, decreased wound complications, pain medications and length of stay with a minimally invasive approach. Utilization for intracorporeal diversion is increasing and uh, it is an advanced maneuver, but with experience, it can be efficient from a time standpoint and complications can be minimized. What's next or where do we need to go? We need to look at the long-term follow-up five years, 10 years and beyond, but there's no, I don't think there's a reason to suspect that we would see much difference from a, from a, a cancer specific outcome. Functional outcomes have been looked at in kind of a cursory fashion, but not in a long-term fashion. We still need to know about the functional outcomes after intracorporeal diversion. And then uh, the, the jury's still out, like what is the true advantage of the intracorporeal approach versus an open? Well, hopefully the IROC will shed some uh, information on that and we look forward to seeing the data 
that'll come out of that in the next couple of years. And with that, I'll conclude. So thank you guys for all your attention. Uh, sorry, we went over a little bit, but um, yeah, if there's any, any other questions you guys have, have, I'm happy to entertain them. You will. That, that was super wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Go. Um, and of course, you guys make it look super easy. Um, but in practice, how long does it take um, a surgeon that you've seen to become comfortable with intracorporeal? Yeah, so I think it's two parts to that question. First is getting comfortable with the extirpative portion and getting your, your robotic cystectomy and node dissection time down. That's probably going to be, I mean, it really depends on where you're coming in, in terms of learning. Most of you guys will come in with a lot of pelvic surgery experience. You've done robotic cystectomy in some cases, which is great, but you'll have a lot of experience with prostate. So I think in those cases, um, the number is probably about 30, 20 to 30 to, to get that cystectomy portion down. On, and, but that's probably just to be able to do it and get through the operation. There's a lot, as you guys know, with all operations, there's a lot more nuance to nerve sparing, to advanced cases, um, uh, locally advanced cases, et cetera. And, uh, and so that learning will continue on probably in the first 50 to 75 and beyond. In, in terms of intracorporeal diversion, similarly, I mean, I think once you tackle the cystectomy, you've got it down pat, adding an intracorporeal diversion doesn't take long to master the basic principles. And that is uh, being able to handle the bowel, being able to assess your bowel anastomosis and perform it reliably. I think in that first 20 to 30 cases, you will be able to do that that was, that's been shown in, in some of the reviews, the Pasadena Conference and, and others have looked at, uh, consensus have looked at, at some of that. Uh, one way to overcome that learning curve, as I mentioned, is mentorship. So there was a study out of Karolinska where uh, they had, had a senior surgeon directly mentoring a new surgeon on how to do intracorporeal diversion. And it didn't take nearly as many cases to, to reach that level of time as well as reduction in complications. So senior surgeon went through maybe 50 to 100 cases, showed a handful of, of more complications in that early learning curve when they were trying to develop the technique. But the new surgeon within that first 30 cases was able to reach the same level of complications uh, at the end that the senior surgeon had. So they were able to kind of shortcut some of the complications and the challenges of the learning curve. So look, mentorship is really important, I think, for this operation. You don't want to reinvent the wheel and you don't want to try to figure it out, uh, you know, on the fly because that, that leads to a lot of frustration and potential issues with complications. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think is uh, um, sort of preventing robotic cystectomy from achieving like robotic prostatectomy levels of adoption throughout the sort of broader urologic oncology community? Yeah. I mean, I think it's getting there. Honestly, I think in the next 10 years, you probably won't have many people who are, are trained or even have the experience of an open cystectomy. You know, most of the folks who are graduating will, uh, as your experience may attest, may have never even seen a, an open cystectomy. So uh, I think that's going to change, uh, just as it did with prostate. Prostate is a little bit more prevalent, more centers are doing it, and probably a little bit more democratized than cystectomy. You know, most centers or urologists may not do cystectomy. They may send it, send it to a tertiary center. And, but I, what, I, what I would say is that at most academic centers, there's a proportion of those that are doing robotics and it's growing. Uh, and I think it's only a matter of time that that's gonna take place. All right, so anything else you guys have? Thank you so much, Dr. Goetz. This was, this was amazing. And yeah. Well, thanks for the opportunity. I hope you guys got something. And we'll see you when you come on to the service. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Go. Take care. Thank Have you. We appreciate it. Thank Bye. you. Yep. Bye-bye.